Hi, I'm Tom Laskowski, uh, Director of Midwest Native Skills, and we're back on, for our Thursday uh, little broadcast. Today it's on uh, bees and bees and honey. Before we get started with that, just uh, for any new people, want to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the school and uh, uh, who we are. Uh, we're uh, a non-military survival school. And our theme is Rediscovering the Old Ways, and one of those uh, is our topic today, uh, bees and beekeeping. Uh, but we start out with non-military survival. I want to say we love our military, but the survival classes that we teach is more what the Native Americans taught, where the military uses equipment for surviving. We teach what's, uh, what the Native Americans uh, use, what, what nature provides. Uh, we started in 1997, expanded um, uh, from the wilderness survival to uh, uh, wild ed edible and medicinal plants, and from there we went on uh, to uh, uh, rediscovering old ways with uh, uh, homesteading skills like uh, wine making, cheese making, soap making. Uh, now we're getting into the moonshine making and uh, uh, kind of just get getting back to the roots so uh, that's who we are and that's where we are now and and where we're going uh, just wanted to real briefly let you know what's coming up um, on our plate uh, tomorrow if you're not doing anything we still have room we have a beekeeping class it's a one-day class it's $95 and it's going to take you it starts at 9 in the morning and by the way we're located just south of Cleveland Ohio just about eight miles south of Cleveland, Ohio. If you would be interested in learning uh, the basics of beekeeping, and you don't need a farm or a big plot of ground, uh, if you have uh, live in the suburbs and you have your lot is 50 feet by 150 feet, plenty of room to keep a couple uh, hives of bees. Um, uh, the class is going to, like I said, start at nine o'clock and go to uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. It's ninety-five dollars. And uh, you'd have to give us a call, uh, and we'd give you all the instructions and how to get here and, and all that. Our toll-free number is 888-886-5592, or our website, uh, survivalschool.com. So that's tomorrow. We do have openings in the class, so that'll be tomorrow. Starting Sunday, we still have openings in our six-day survival class. That'll be going from Sunday until next Saturday. That'll be a comprehensive on outdoor wilderness survival. Uh, in uh, two weeks from now, two Thursdays, our normally scheduled live uh, Facebook is going to be on um, uh, family backyard camping. So uh, if you wanted to get your family involved in some camping and you didn't want to go to the state parks, we're going to give you some tips, tricks, some ideas on how you can just have a, a wonderful time camping out in your own backyard. So we're going to be uh, covering that topic. And that'll be on June 25th. Uh, and by the way, on July 25th, 26th, a month from then, we are actually going to have a class on family camping. For those of you that have never gone camping or maybe you've gone camping once or twice, uh, a little unfamiliar with it, a little unsure about maybe how to set up tents, how to start fires, uh, camping, uh, that's what the class is going to be all about. We're going to be showing you from the basics, uh, so you don't have to be embarrassed or that, gee, I don't know how to start a fire, or I don't know how to set up a tent, or how the heck do you cook on an open fire? We're going to go over all those things. So there's no dumb questions in that class. Uh, we're going to be starting. We won't ask you who doesn't know how to cook on an open fire. We're not going to ask those questions. We're just going to show you how to do it. So, uh, that'll be July uh, 25th, 26th, a family camping class. And not for, only for families. If you're an individual that just wants to learn how to camp. Come to that class. We'll show you how. Um, and uh, what else is coming up in July? July uh, 18th is our summer wild edible medicinal plant class. So that'll be a, a, a good class to come to. Okay, uh, let's get on to today's topic. Bees, beekeeping. In almost all of our classes I give during breaks or things, uh, if we ha uh, hold them uh, at our home here, I have... Uh, uh, several hives of bees in the backyard and people see the hives of bees 
and uh, the questions come up about bees all the time. You know, my grandfather had bees, my father had bees, neighbors had bees. Uh, we always get questions on bees. So please, uh, ask some questions on, uh, on uh, uh, if you have questions on bees. What I thought the format would be today, uh, the first 20 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about beekeeping. If you're interested in how to get started or what, what it takes to become a beekeeper, uh, I'm going to go over that for the first 20 minutes. Then for 10 minutes after that, I'll talk a little bit about honey, the benefits of honey to you health-wise, uh, what honey can do for you, uh, so, some of the uh, tricks you can use for honey with baking, why, why, you, know, uh, why you might want to use honey in baking instead of sugars and things. And then uh, maybe for the last 15 minutes, uh, really open it up to any open questions you have uh, on, uh, on bees, beekeeping. Uh, might not have all the answers, but I've been doing this for 30 years, so I might have uh, came across the question before, so I, I might have had uh, some experience with it. Okay, uh, uh, Sarah uh, had a real good question yesterday that I thought would be a, maybe a good place to start before I go into what it takes to start beekeeping. Uh, her question was, uh, what rules need to be followed, we're in Ohio here, so in Ohio for beekeeping, such as insurance, registering, and inspections. Well, the good news is there's very little uh, rules or uh, regarding uh, beekeeping. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a beekeeper, uh, what you need to do, and we're going to go into the logistics of, of how to order bees and all that. Uh, you should ch first check with your local authorities. Some municipalities might have regulations on if you can keep bees. Uh, they're getting very few and far between uh, just because uh, there's less and less uh, beekeepers now. The bees uh, are having a harder time, so the state of Ohio is encouraging beekeepers. So if some municipality says, yeah, we, we don't want beekeepers around, now they're kind of encouraging people to keep bees. So, uh, but first thing, call City Hall, uh, ask for the law department and say, hey, are there any regulations about if I want to keep one or two uh, 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 beehives in my backyard? Uh, the next thing you should probably do, this is not required, but it's a, just a smart thing to do is go around and talk to your neighbors. Say, hey, I'm thinking about having a couple uh, beehives. Um, I will tell you, uh, from my personal experience, uh, when I first started bees and now, uh, you really won't see any more bees in your yard having beehives in your backyard. Now, that seems kind of counterintuitive, but uh, typically what bees do, they'll go within about a two, two and a half mile distance away from your house to get the pollen and the nectar. So you would think, my God, I have hives of bees here. Wouldn't they be right in my yard? The answer is really not. Um, if you want to ensure that doesn't happen, uh, right in front of your hive, you can put a small, maybe four-foot fence. This, when they come out of the hive, they'll have to fly at four-foot level, and from there, they'll go higher. So that ensures you won't have any bees in your yard. Um, so there's little tricks like that. But uh, you won't really see any more bees in your yard than you do right now. Uh, Insurance-wise, there's really no insurance added insurance you need for bees. Uh, honeybees are extremely gentle. Uh, so if you're worried about people getting stung or anything, it's high, no more than they're getting stung in your yard right now. Um, registering your bees... If you do have hives in your yard, the state does require you to register them. Your yard is now what they call an apiary. Any location with beehives is called an apiary. And um, they will charge you $5. Now that's if you have one beehive or 500 beehives in your yard. It's still $5. Uh, that's just saying you have beehives in your yard. Uh, now by registering them, that's all it is, is a registration saying you have beehives. Um, they will ask you, do you want a bee inspector to come and look at your beehives? Now, most people say, oh my God, there's going to be an inspector coming in. Uh, there's one bee inspector per county. They are not coming to bust you. They're not coming 
as a spy on you. They're coming as a helper to you. Uh, a lot of beekeepers don't know about all the latest innovations, all the latest medications or whatever latest things for beekeeping, but the county bee inspector does. So uh, I would encourage you to have the bee inspector come. Uh, they'll come, they'll look at your hives, and they'll leave a note, or if you're at home, they'll let you come and look at the hives with them, and they'll say, oh, did you notice that your queen is not laying good? Did you notice this? Did you notice that? Like I said, they're not looking to bust you. They're not looking to uh, to do anything. They're looking to help you out. And every, for the last 30 years, that's all the inspectors are. You can opt out. If you say, no, I prefer not to have my bees inspected, they request that, they won't bother you. Uh, but, so there's no, there's registering. The state does require you to say, yes, I have beehives. Uh, you can opt out of the inspections. You need no other insurance. Um, just make sure that your municipality doesn't have a law against you uh, keeping bees. I hope that answers your question, uh, Sarah, or anybody else that has that question. So, that goes with that question. So, you want to become a beekeeper. What's the first thing you do? Well, uh, first thing you have to do, you need to order your bees. The time to order your bees is in February or March of the year. There's places, usually in the southern states, that raise bees, and you need to order them about that time, uh, and they'll ship them up to you in April or May. Uh, you'll be ordering what they call a three-pound package. A uh, three-pound package will come in a box like this. And this comes by the U.S. mail. This package will come... Uh, uh, to your post office uh, just like this <laughs> and they'll be full of bees in here this is screened uh, your post office will give you a call at 6 o'clock in the morning when they arrive because uh, there'll be bees buzzing in here and uh, they'll say Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so your bees have arrived could you please come now and get them <laughs> uh, most people are afraid of bees uh, they're in here they're safe uh, they're totally docile. They have nothing to protect, so don't worry about them. Uh, so it's nice if you go down to your post office and, and pick up your bees. Uh, before this happens, you should have your hives built. Uh, that's one thing we do in our bee class. We show you how to build the hives up, the, uh, your beehives. Uh, I brought a model here of what a hive looks like. You probably see these. Now, this is a mini version. You've probably seen the white hives. They're built up about this high. They come with several boxes like this. Each box inside has frames. Again, this is a miniature version. The frames like this. You would put a wax foundation in here, and this would all be built up before your bees come. So you would have these boxes all built up all ready to go in your backyard waiting for your bees to come. So when your bees come, it's a simple matter of you taking this three pound package, you would pry this little canister out. This is filled with sugar water. In the middle of this package is a little matchbox and your queen would be in here so your little queens in here there's a little plug in here with some candy you would take this you would simply just take out one of the frames hang this in there and then once that would be hanging in there with the queen, you would take the, this out, you would take this box full of bees, and you dump this in. Shake it just like this, and your bees would dump into this box. Put the lid on, leave it sit for three days. Don't bother it. After three days, 
open it up, and this is still hanging in here. You pull this out, make sure they release the queen, they would eat through this candy. 99 times out of 100, they release the queen. If they didn't, you take your, this is the main tool you use, it's called a hive tool. It's really just a little pry bar, they name it a hive tool. If they didn't release the queen, you just take this, you pry this little screen out. There's a screen there, if you can see it. Pry it, and you release her physically. You won't have to do that, they release her. Uh, release her in there. Put the frame back in. Put the cover on, and leave them set now, and they take care of it. They build out the comb make honey for you. It's about that easy to keep these. It's a, it's a little more involved, but uh, if you want the down dirty basics, that's, that's your beekeeping. But people say, well, how do the bees come? Three pound package. How many bees are in here? About three to five thousand in this, in this box. It'll be about, I'd say half, about three quarters full of bees. And they're just buzzing around in here. cost of that box of bees is about $140. So to start a hive, for the bees alone, you're talking $140 just to buy the bees. To buy all this equipment, the boxes, which you put together yourself, the wood, the frames and all, you're probably talking up right around $250 for all the wood, all the frames and all that. Here's what an actual size of a frame looks like. Now, there's actually two size boxes. The bottom boxes here, there's two of them, they're deep. That's where the queen will lay her eggs and the babies. This is the size of the frames in the deeper boxes. The ones above here are shallower. You can see the size difference. These on top, the boxes above here would be the what they call the honey boxes or honey supers if you want the correct terminology. Uh, so you're going to have two deep boxes and then two or three of the shallow for honey. So you have quite a you know, and each box has ten frames in it. So total for a one beehive, you have four boxes and you have ten frames each, so you have forty frames plus you have the wax foundation that's going to go in each one of these like this that the bees are going to draw the honeycomb on so you have a lot of pieces in there so that's where you get your 250 dollars the wood and all that all these have to be painted and you notice most beehives are painted white and people i always ask why do you think they're painted white and the first answer is well in the summertime it keeps them cool Makes sense. But then, in the wintertime, then keep them too cool. It wouldn't keep them warm. So that's not really right. People go, well, I don't know why. The answer is, there's really no reason. It's just that whoever taught the beekeeper how to keep bees had theirs painted away. So really, a beehive can be any color. So a few years back, we have our house painted a, a green color, so I painted my green to match the house. And the bees just like it. So, do you like blue? They can be blue. I have a you, question. What? You have a question. What's that? Sarah would like to know if you need to sedate the bees before you dump them in the hive. You, well, Sarah, Sarah, I like your questions. Uh, no, you don't need to sedate them, but it is not a bad idea to spray them down with sugar water. That says two things. One, uh, it makes their wings all sticky. So it makes it, it, them harder to fly. Then they're kind of busy cleaning each other off, which makes it harder for them to fly. So when you dump them into the box, they're all sticky. They kind of don't want to fly. They're cleaning each other off. And then they just go in the box. Now, the bees are going to go where the queen is. They have her scent from the trip they made up from Georgia or Texas or wherever they came. So they have the scent of the queen. They always go to the scent of the queen. So if some of them do happen to fly around, they're going to get her scent. So they're going to say, okay, where's my queen? She's in there. And they're going to go right in the box. 
So it, you're not going to lose any by that. Um, you use a good word, sedate the bees. I, I like that term. Um, whenever you do go into the bees, say for just checking the bees, you know, uh, and people say, well, how much time did, does it take to, to, to devote to the bees? Probably, if you're a beekeeper, figure on about an hour a week. That's about it. And you think, okay, what am I going to do in this hour? You're just going in to make sure that the queen is laying. You're going to go in and make sure that she's laying in the right places. And I, we can talk about this. Uh, uh, you want her to lay in the lower boxes because if she keeps laying up, then she'll think she's out of space and quit laying. You don't want that. So then if she's on top, you just take the frame that she's laying on and put her in the lower box. So you're just kind of checking on her. But when you go in there, um, in midsummer, a stack of boxes, which is called a beehive, could have as many as 50 to 60,000 bees. That's a lot of bees. And you're going into their house. I know if I come into your house, Sarah, and started taking stuff out and putting it on a tree lawn and taking things out of your house, your living room, you might get a little upset with me. Same thing with the bees. You start taking frames out and moving them around, some of them might get upset with you. So, in order to alleviate them getting upset, you use this little gizmo called the smoker. This, you can say, sedates the bees. You put, open it up, and you put either leaves in here or burlap or something that smokes. Light it, and it smokes, hence the name smoker. Got little bellows on the back, and when you puff on it, smoke comes out of here. So what you do, when you go in here, smoke comes out and smoke goes in, into the beehive. Now, they're not sure exactly what this does. It does one of two things. One, it masks their pheromones so they can't give an alarm signal that, hey, somebody is messing with our beehive. And then they can't give an alarm. Or, it makes the whole hive think that there's a forest fire nearby. And then, rather than worrying about protecting the hive, they're saying, hey, if there's a forest fire, we might lose the hive. We better gorge ourselves on some honey in case we have to leave the hive. We better have some food stores up in case we might have to spend some time building a new hive. So their major main focus then is eating the honey, and they're not too worried about you messing with their hive. Either way, it calms the bees. So I can go in here, I can take out frames, and they don't really care. Another thing is what you wear. Lighter colors, bees could care less. They ignore you. If you wear dark colors, I think they think you're a bear. And they don't like you. So if uh, anytime you approach a beehive or are around a beehive, make sure you wear white colors. That's why you'll see a beekeeper in a, uh, a white suit. They just totally ignore you. If you have dark colors on, dark jeans, dark shirt, uh, they're going to check you out, or worse yet, they're going to come and the guard bees, there's about 20 at the beginning of uh, entrance of a hive, they might come and a couple might even try to sting you. Now, m most beekeepers will just wear a shirt like this, short sleeves, because they're relaxed when they're around bees. They will be wearing a veil like this. Almost, not almost, all beekeepers will wear a veil. Simple reason to that, on your face, what is dark? your eyes and your mouth. So if the bees are going to fly at anything on your face, they're going to be flying at your eyes or in your mouth. And you don't want that to happen. So by wearing a veil, they're going to, you're protecting your eyes and your mouth. So all beekeepers will wear this hat with this veil just to protect your eyes and mouth. But usually the bees are careless about anything else. Do you have another question? Nope. So the smoker, we can just say for conversation, calms the bees. Whenever you go in your bees, fire up your smoker, puff some smoke, puff some smoke at the entrance, and you can go in. Now, a new beekeeper should definitely do this. I've been in my bees uh, half a dozen times this summer so far. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 some years. I'm very comfortable around my bees. The way I move, uh, it just seems that I haven't used smoke yet this year. I'm moving slower, more gentle. I'm comfortable around them. The bees are totally calm, not upset at all with me. Uh, I also have 
the strains of these are very gentle. So, no need for me to use smoke. Um, now, that could change later in the year. Maybe they might get ornery. Uh, also, I've been doing it on nice days like this. Sunny sky, blue sky. Bees could care less. If it's overcast rainy, they get ornery. Uh, later in the day, they get a little more ornery. So if it's an overcast day, I definitely need the smoke. But if it's a nice, beautiful day, typically you don't. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. What else about the bees? Sometimes you have to requeen if you're a beekeeper. Uh, that you, you look in there, like I said, maybe once a week you go in, check your bees out. And if the queen is not laying a good pattern, that means on the frame, it should be almost solid with babies. And you can see the babies. Um, they lay larvae and then they cap them over. Uh, if it's real spotty, that means the queen's not laying good. Uh, that's not good. They will supersede her normally, but if you're actually... Uh, wanting your hive to produce honey, you want a good laying queen. So what the beekeeper does, she actually, he actually goes in there, and she looks different. She's longer and a little bigger than the others, and with time you can spot her pretty easily. You find the queen and kill her. Just, and leave the hive without a queen for two or three days. Get on the phone, and you can uh, call a supplier and say, I need a new queen. And for anywhere between $28 and $40, they'll send you a new queen. It'll come in U.S. mail in a package like this. Comes in the mail. Open it up. And what inside do you find but the same little matchbox like this? And you do it the same way. Now, the hive was queenless, so you open it up just like you did before. You take out a frame. Hang this in, put it in, put this in, put the cover back on, leave it for three days. In three days, the this hive does get the scent of the new queen. They will release her within three days. That happens nine out of ten times. Uh, in three days, go in just to make sure they released her. If they didn't, you release her physically, just take the screen off, and you have a new queen, and uh, she'll... Uh, start laying and it's a brand new queen so you'll have a, uh, a good laying queen uh, I said they'll do it normally sometimes you'll see a hive swarming uh, let's see what time what time am I have I want to make sure I talk about honey and stuff you have a half hour hmm? you have a half hour Sarah wants to know how what, how long the lifespan is of a queen a uh, queen Queen will live probably two years, and before she starts eh, going downhill. And a queen, uh, she spends all of her uh, life laying eggs. She'll lay between 1,500 and 2,000 eggs per day in the summertime, starting in March, ending in about September. That's a lot of laying eggs every day. So. How often do you have to get new bees? When, how often do I have to get new bees? Whenever the hive dies, whenever I don't have bees. Why would a hive die? Um, I said there could be about 60,000 bees in the middle of summer. Queen's laying like crazy. End of summer, 50,000 bees. Queen stops laying in September, October. So there's, this thing's full of bees. She stops laying. And the temperature starts get, getting cold. So what the bees do, they cluster around the queen and they keep the hive at 53 degrees all winter long. How do they do that? With their body heat. So they don't exactly hibernate, but they're eating honey and they're keeping the queen in the center and they have this ball in the hive and they move through the hive very slowly, eating honey, keeping the hive 53 degrees regardless of outside temperature. Eating honey, moving along. But the outside of the cluster is exposed to the outside air temperature. So this 50,000, the outside die, so the 50,000 gets to be 40,000 in December, 30,000 by January, 20,000 late February, 10,000 by March, assuming they got enough honey to keep eating and keep that temperature up. So come late February, March, a couple things can happen. One, they run out of honey, 
and they starve to death and die. Hence, I have no bees. I need to order new bees. Another thing that could happen is they get chilled. They have plenty of honey, and this is what happened to one of my hives this year. We get a lot of rain, a lot of moisture gets into the hive, and the temperature drops from 45 degrees down to 20 degrees. We have a lot of moisture in the hive. The bees get chilled. They can't maintain that 53 degree temperature. They die. Bees die. I have a dead hive. Have to replace them come spring. Um, those are about the only two reasons them dying out in, in the wintertime. Um, I was going to talk about bee swarming. If you don't check the bees often, and that queen keeps coming up and lays in the upper cell, she hits the honey super. Now, even though she has room in the bottom, she's not that smart. She's, instead of going back down on her own, she says, oh, there's honey up there? I must be out of room. The hive must be full. I guess I must better leave the hive and swarm. Well, she should just go down, but she's not that smart. So what she does is uh, she'll leave the hive and fly onto a tree branch. Half of the bees in the hive will follow her to that tree branch and cluster around her. You see that as a swarm. A couple scout bees will go out and find a new location, either behind some aluminum siding or in a hollow tree, to start a new hive. Now, so you had 60,000 bees in the hive, half of them, 30,000, went with the old queen. Bees that are left in the hive are now queenless. They go, oh, we don't have a queen. They go to one of the new larvae she just laid, which are three days old. They'll start feeding six of those new larvae with what they call royal jelly. It's a honey substance that's excreted by some of the worker bees to these six larvae. It will make those six larvae, which would be normal worker bees, into six queens. One of the queens will hatch first in 21 days. When she hatches, she'll find the other five, kill them. Now there's a new queen in the hive. For the next week, she'll go on a mating flight. She'll fly out of the hive, go to about 2,000 feet. They have all this documented mate with as many drones as she can, drones are the male bees, for one week, coming back to the hive every night. Then she'll stay in the hive for the remaining two years of her life or however long she lives and lay 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. That's the life of her. I cast pause for a second there. Uh, so the hive still continues, but the problem is I had 60,000 bees giving me honey. Now I only have 30,000. So the honey production at the hive took a drastic nosedive. And I don't have 60,000 bees going into winter. I only have 30,000 bees, which makes that hive a weak hive. So that hive is a, a real handicap in getting through the winter, which necessarily doesn't make it a great hive to get through the winter. So there's other. that's another reason why it might not get through. I have two questions. Okay, good. Rich wants to know how much do bees cost, and Teresa wants to know how does the queen get out of the hive? Oh, okay. How much do bees cost? Uh, three pound package, $140. This is really the only way you can start a hive by buying a three pound package. I can catch a swarm. If somebody calls me, the local police and say, hey, somebody called, there's a swarm up in the tree. Easy to catch. If I can get to it, if it's low enough, which they rarely are, all I do is I go to the house where they are, I take an empty garbage can, I take an empty garbage can, I put it under the big bunch of bees, shake the branch, they all fall in the garbage can, I put a lid on it, I carry that garbage can home, I need an empty hive at home, and I just dump it in, and uh, hope I have to catch the queen, and I have a new hive for free. That's the easiest way. That's the cheapest way. But I have to wait for somebody to call me saying that they have a swarm in their tree that I can get to. The question was... How did the queens get out? How did the queens get out? At the bottom of the hive, this would be the front of the hive, there is a 
opening at the bottom. This is where all the bees get out. This is your entrance. She just walks down here, flies out, flies in. And this is where your guard bees, those 20 guard bees, they make sure only the bees get in here that belong here. If another bee comes here from another hive, if they have pollen, if they have honey, they'll allow the transfer bees to take that pollen or honey in there, but they won't let the bees in. They have a whole hierarchy system in here. Okay, that's a brief introduction. Let's talk a little bit about honey before I take any more questions. Um, let's see, something about honey. Uh, let's... I bought you different colors. Different colors of honey. Very light colored honey. Little darker colored honey. And even darker yet. Typically, uh, lighter colored honey is from the spring. Uh, medium colored is for summer. And the darkest is typically a fall honey. Uh, also, rule of thumb, the darker the color of honey, the more antioxidants it has the better it is for you. Personal preference, oh, typically the darker colored honey is used for cooking. I know in Europe they love the darker colored honey. Uh, personal preference, I love the lighter colored honey. It tastes a little different. Um, so if you ever can get this, honey never goes bad. They found honey in Egyptian tombs. Uh, perfectly safe to eat perfectly great. Now honey does something called crystallization and here you can see the bottom here it's crystallizing in this jar. Um, what happens, I'll give you some science lessons here, if you go back to uh, high school chemistry remember what a super saturated solution is? That's a solution where there's too much of a chemical in that's supposed to be in there? Well Honey is a super saturated solution. There's actually too much sugar in the honey than the liquid can support. So, when that happens and it crosses a temperature around 52, 53 degrees a couple times, that sugar precipitates out, falls out of solution. So when that happens, it's called crystallization. Now, when that happens, People think, oh my God, the honey's bad. No, all you have to do is put this honey in 140 degree water, leave it set there for about two hours, turns right back to honey, it's fine. Uh, if, this does, if it crystallizes on the store shelf though, the average person doesn't know that it's not bad. The store owner doesn't like it, so they go, well, we don't want this happening. So what they do, they pasteurize the honey. They heat it up to about 165 degrees kill a lot of the good stuff in the honey, the enzymes, the, the, the good stuff, and it reduces the chance of this crystallization. So it can sit on the store shelf for maybe a year or two and not have this happen. So it's good for the store owner. It doesn't crystallize as easy, but it's not so good for you. It still tastes sweet. It doesn't affect the taste, but for the, it puts the health benefits in the toilet. So that's why the honey you want is what they call raw honey, unprocessed honey, cold pressed honey, all kind of fancy names. All it means is the honey was not heated. If you want good, healthy honey, make sure it wasn't heated. So uh, ask your beekeeper what he does to it. If he says nothing, he takes it from the, from the honeycomb into the bottle. That's what you want. So I think you answered the questions. We had a question about what's the difference between raw versus processed honey, and is raw honey safe, and why is raw honey better? I think I answered them all. Yep. Sarah wants you to discuss harvesting honeycomb. Harvesting honeycomb. Okay. Uh, what I do, or what you want to do as a beekeeper, uh, if you want to harvest the honey in the comb, uh, there's something, uh, a special kind of comb you use, it's called a Ross, R-O-S-S, round, R-O-U-N-D. It, it's a plastic frame just like this, and it has circles here, four of them, 
and you put a wax sheet of wax here and you put it in the honeycomb. So that what the bees do, they draw the comb out on it, fill it with honey, and they cap it over. So then you take this out and it has a band already on here and you just pop it out and you put two caps on it and you sell this and it's an entire round, and you've probably seen them in the stores, it's a round uh, honeycomb with a plastic band around there capped with honey. Uh, that's one way to do it. If you saw a chunk of honey in a jar like this, very simply, you would just take a normal frame like this, and when you're, you, uh, you would have some of it that you spin out in a, uh, in the back there, if you can see back there is a metal container. That's called an extractor. That's what I put these frames in. And you take a uh, hot knife like this when I'm extracting the honey. I take the cappings off here, put it in there, and I spit, that spins the uh, frames around and it's a big centrifuge basically. And it spins the honey out of the honeycomb and it all falls to the bottom. There's a gate on the bottom and I just put it into the jars. It's that simple to get the honey out of the comb. But what I would do, I would keep a couple in the combs, I would take a knife, and I would just cut it out. And I'd take those pieces, and I'd plop it into the jars. A beekeeper is reluctant to do that, for the simple reason. It takes the bees about a month to draw the honeycomb out. Then it takes them another month to fill that same honeycomb with honey. So you've got two months involved. Uh, a beekeeper is in the business of keeping bees to make money. So, if I just take my, this year, if I let them spend a month to build up the honeycomb, and then a month to fill it, and I just take the frame out, uncap it, spin the honey out, I still have the comb all drawn out, put it back in the hive, and all they have to do is refill it up again, they can do that in a month, and I might get two or sometimes even three crops in a year. If I destroy the comb, they have to rebuild the comb out, and I'll be lucky if I get two. Probably not. I'll probably have to wait till next year for them to build the comb out and then refill it again. So, from a business point of view, I'd rather just put an empty comb in, an empty jar in, let them refill the jar rather than destroy the jar, have them rebuild it all, and then take it out. So, uh, is it worth the added sales for me to destroy it, to put a little piece of honeycomb in here? No. <coughs> Sarah I'm, wants to know if it's okay to do just one or two frames for the honeycomb. You can. Uh, when I did that in the past, uh, most of the questions I have is, what do I do with this honeycomb, and how do I get the honey out to put it into my tea? People didn't know what to do with the honey. Now, in the old days, you and I know, Sarah, you chew on the honey. Uh, it's like gum, stuff like that. Uh, but most people didn't know what to do with it. On top of that, the way I sell my honey, in front of uh, my house, I have a, a cart with the honey. And that sits in the sun all day. So if the honey is out there with this wax comb in it, it's going to be just one big glob mess, one chunk. It's not going to be in a honeycomb anymore. So if you have a store, open-air market, that would work. Her dad likes it. Her dad likes it. Then, then you could definitely do it for your dad. It's worth it in your case. I would get... What I would do then, Sarah, I wouldn't go with the Ross rounds. I would get a frame, get a couple frames... Just put it in there, destroy them for your dad. That's what you did. By the way, if you are thinking about doing a hive, and if you live not close to me or anything like that, you want three hives. Most people say, well, I'm going to start with one hive. It's not a good idea. Typically, you're going to have one hive that's strong, one hive that's eh, pretty good, and one hive that's weak. If you have only one hive, it's going to be strong, medium, or weak. 
Well, if it's strong, you're okay, but if it's the other two, there's nothing you can do about it. If you have three hives, you can take the babies from a strong hive, take a couple of those frames out, put it in the weak hive, and you can swap babies. They'll accept them. So you can swap the babies, or brood as they call them, to get three strong hives going into the wintertime. And it's no more work, trust me, to have three hives than one. One hive, just as much work as two, just as much as three. Four or five is starting to become work. Six or seven, it's a job. Trust me from experience. So one, two, or three, it's fun. One to five, it's work. Six or seven, it's a job. How far apart should you keep the hives? Doesn't matter. Rich wants to know. Rich wants to know how far apart you keep the hives. Doesn't matter, Rich. Uh, you can have them right next to each other. Uh, they they go two and a half miles away. Now, moving hives is an issue. If you have a hive here and you go, geez, I'm going to move it four feet away. You know, the, the, I, I don't like it here. Or move it to the other side of the yard. That hive will die. When they leave the hive, they do orienting flights, and you can watch this happen. You can tell they're on orienting flights because the bees, the young bees, actually are with an older bee, and you can tell by the size of the bees, the young bees are smaller. But the young bees will be flying backwards, always with their head facing the hive. So they'll be flying backwards, back and forth, this way, this way. They're using the sun and where the hive is. But if you move the hive five feet from where the original hive was, they won't know where the hive is. And they'll die. <laughs> so if you're going to move a hive, you're going to have to move it about three to five miles away. Or wait till winter time and then move it your five feet. But in the middle of summer, wherever you put the hive, it's got to stay there. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but that's, that's the way it is. But yeah, you can have like seven, eight hives, two feet apart, doesn't matter. Rich has been following you since the red headband days. Oh, I'm glad. Cool. I like that. Rich. Three hives, how much water do they need per day? A lot. I don't know exactly how much, uh, but it's a good idea to put a water source out for your bees. Uh, and uh, I think I answered this when he put the question up uh, about putting water out. If you're putting water out for your bees, don't put it right in front of your hive like I did about 10 years ago because they have no way to communicate to each other 10 feet. It has to be at least 30 feet away. So if you put water right in front of your hive, they won't touch it because they have no way of telling the other bees there's water 10 feet away. Uh, but. Uh, at 30 feet, they have a way with their bee language to say there's water. So, put water 30 feet away. Uh, we uh, we put a fountain, a, a waterfall exactly, in our yard, and it's a good uh, 100 feet away from the beehives. They love it. Now, you don't have to put water for your bees. However, do you want your bees to spend half their day foraging for water or foraging for nectar? to make you honey that you can sell and make money. It's up to you. I'd rather have them foraging for nectar to make me money. Also, do I want them to go to my water source, which is chlorine free? Or do I want them to go to my neighbor's pool and getting my neighbors upset? Mm, I think I'll keep them away from my neighbor's pool, go to my water source, as a homeowner, what can you do to support bees? Don't use Roundup. Okay? There's a, uh, th this colony collapse you've heard of before. Uh, they're still not 100% sure. Uh, there was pretty conclusive evidence, and all of a sudden, now I've heard nothing about it. I'm not a conspiracy guy, but unusual that all of a sudden everything's hush hush on it but there was some kind of nicotine nicotinoidal compound that they really were pretty much convinced the last I've heard that was causing this problem on colony collapse now colony collapse is where the bees 
doesn't kill the bees directly, but it makes them do stupid stuff. Kind of like an Alzheimer's, I think. Uh, I've had it happen to my bees. By stupid stuff, I mean um, come fall, they put no honey stores away for winter. None. So, okay, that happened to me once, so I put feeders on it. You put sugar water on top of your beehives to, to give them food so they can store it. I put the sugar water on it, they didn't take it. So they go into winter with absolutely no food stores, they died. Of course they will. I've had an entire box. I said when they swarm, they usually do that July-ish, so they can have time to build a new hive. They take half the bees and go. I've had a hive, total hive, leave the hive in November. Where did they go? I have no idea, but they left the hive. The bees don't do that, except if they're a little bit, you know. Uh, I had a hive do that. So that's what I mean, they do stupid stuff. Stuff they wouldn't necessarily do in nature. And they believe it's because of one of the nicotinoidal type compounds in Roundup. So uh, I'm not saying it's the only thing, but one of the major things is, is Roundup. So that's one thing you can do. Plant a garden. Plant a garden too. But, uh, yep. If you do have bees, you're going to notice your productivity of the garden go up too. I said you won't see any more bees in your uh, yard. Uh, we didn't, but we did see the productivity of our garden go up. So. Uh, how are we doing on time? I don't want to keep these people here longer than I need to. About seven minutes. Oh, I, I'm even going long now. I, I try to keep these to 45 minutes. Okay, uh, just to let you know, uh, just to kind of recap, keep questions coming if you have any, but I'll try to uh, wrap this up. Um, in two weeks, we're going to do uh, family camping in your backyard. You know, how you can have a nice time without going to a state park or something and just have a ball. Um, a month after that, if you want to learn camping, hands-on, it's going to be a Saturday. Saturday, we're going to get together at 10 o'clock to south of Cleveland uh, and teach you everything from how to make a campfire to how to cook on an open flame to how to make s'mores, the whole nine yards, uh, how to pitch a tent. How to look at stars, how to pick out stars. Uh, our planned class is July 18th. We're going to make some hors d'oeuvres from some weeds in your garden. Yeah. All okay, kinds so, of. Well, we're going to make a first aid sap that I challenge you to find a better uh, thing to, to heal a cut. And if you're a doctor or in the medical, medical profession, I challenge you at your hospital or uh, med center, bring. Whatever you have that you think heals a cut, and I'll put it up against our first aid set. Um, and uh, and tomorrow we still have room in our uh, beekeeping class. Give us a call, 888-886-5592, or our six-day survival class starting on Sunday. Any more questions? We're good. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hope to see you here in two weeks for the camping. And... Uh, if you have any uh, suggestions on what we can uh, do on future broadcasts, let us know. Just email me at tom at survivalschool.com. Have a good weekend.